Okay. So uh, we can thank everybody for uh, their contribution by questions and uh, answers and uh, remarks, and uh, we can apologize uh, everywhere. And uh, we hope that we in maybe in a few more minutes, uh, we would have a few, you know, more audience uh, that would probably encourage our panelists to go full strength. Uh, in any case, um, I welcome all of you here, and I would like to call up the panel from the European Commission. And um, John, if you could come up here. Uh, he's representing uh, MySpace. Um, well, we had restructured this session uh, because most of our panelists couldn't make their way through uh, because of all the recent developments here in our country. So um, that led us to kind of reshuffling the panelists and uh, restructuring the format. But in any case, um, what we'll do is to start with uh, a video uh, that was um, sent by one of our panelists who couldn't come, but we are going to play that. And then we would um, go through each one of the panelists to talk about the issue. And um, I would leave like half an hour, hopefully, at the end of the session for question and answers. And please write down the comments that you have during the session um, so that um, you can raise them at the end of the session. We, we are aiming for about half an hour uh, for Q&A. And in between, if there is any pressing need, any question that you want to ask desperately, please raise your hand. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, that won't happen, but um, it's not limited to the end of the session. If there is certain uh, thing that you want to catch our attention, please do let us know. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Anjan Bose. I'm from, I'm the ICT officer from ECPATH International and I'll be chairing this session. Uh, the purpose of the session, uh, this workshop, was to talk about the multi-stakeholder um, collaboration and the initiatives that are currently being um, organized uh, in order to protect children online. And um, we felt that to cover the whole spectrum of multi-stakeholder involvement, uh, we would um, bring together a panel that consists of the private sector, the industry, to uh, look into uh, what are the initiatives that they are interested in and they are uh, doing right now, and what are the challenges in doing so, what kind of um, technical uh, challenges they are facing. We also wanted to include the child rights agencies in terms of welfare work, uh, what are the different concepts, what are the, you know, the different uh, elements of their work that uh, they want to share with us. Um, we also wanted to include the, the law enforcement, but unfortunately uh, for this particular session we didn't have um, their representation, again because of the lack of um, you know, all the travel restrictions and so on. Yeah, well, um, what can we do at this moment? But we do also have another panelist sitting out there uh, who will join us later, and he's from Brazil, and he will be presenting on issues uh, that relates to developing and developed countries, some of the challenges that we face in building networks and so on. So without further ado, I will just um, get the session going, but before I do that, uh, I would like to just very quickly mention to you um, about a recently held Congress. Um, I think it's pretty relevant in this context. Uh, we had a World Congress on Commercial Sexual Exploitation of Children uh, organized by the Government of Brazil, UNICEF, and ECPATH International, along with the uh, NGO group on, on CRC. And this brought together 3,000 participants from different parts of the world, and more importantly, 137 state representatives. And one of the highlights of the area that they've all felt um, needs prioritization is the issue of 
um, child sexual abuse and sexual exploitation online, in the online environment. It's a growing concern. And at the end of the day, at the end of the meeting, we did come up with a set of recommendations, uh, which most of the, I think, 80% of the state parties did comply to. Uh, it's still waiting to be, you know, um, finalized. Uh, in the sense that uh, the remaining uh, states will need to go back and ratify the, not really ratify, but give their um, approval. Uh, I'll just quickly go through the main elements in very, like in two minutes, just so, just so that you know what were the issues that were discussed and what were some of the key recommendations. Um, so it's, it says, we call on states where appropriate with the support of UN agencies, NGOs, the private sector, acad academia, children and young people, and other relevant actors to adopt a clear definition of child pornography in accordance with international standards. Criminalize the production, distribution, receipt, and possession of child pornography, including virtual images and the sexually exploitative representation of children as well as the consumption, access, and viewing of such materials, where there has been no physical contact, extending legal liability to entities such as the corporations and companies in case of responsibility for or involvement in the production and dissemination of such materials, undertake specific and targeted actions to prevent and stop child pornography and the use of the internet and new technologies for the grooming of children into online and off offline abuse, and for the production and dissemination of child pornography and other materials. Victim identification and support and care by specialized staff should be a high priority. Um, well, I'll just mention some of the other key um, recommendations and um, the pledge. Put online safety on the curriculum in schools and promote it through youth organizations and at official meeting points for children. Take the necessary legislative measures to require internet service providers, mobile phone companies, search engines, and other relevant actors to report and remove child pornography websites and child sexual abuse images and develop indicators to monitor results and enhance efforts. Encourage and support internet service providers, mobile phone companies, internet cafes, and other relevant actors to develop and implement with the meaningful participation of parents, children, and adolescents, voluntary code of conduct, and other corporate social responsibility mechanisms, and develop legal tools for enabling the adoption of child protection measures in these businesses. I'll conclude with, there are a few more, which I'm sure uh, uh, you can read more about later, but I'll, I just want to conclude with two final ones. Develop and disseminate m messages informing potential users of legislation on viewing child abuse images and develop programs to reduce the demand for such images. Encourage and support telephone and online hotlines to enable the public, including children, to report the sexual exploitation of children and adolescents online, moving where possible towards harmonized numbers and URLs. Now, um, having said this, I think it gives you the context um, what other speakers are going to contribute. And I think whatever they're going to present will align with some of these recommendations that came up very strongly. And we will see how we can develop this further. So I would like to start by playing the video which was sent by Larry Mazid. Um, John, if you can give him give his... Um... Okay. Yeah, I arranged for two speakers for this session from America, both of whom have not turned up. Uh, this is the first of them. Uh, Larry Majid, a great guy. He's a technology journalist for CBS and uh, CNET and various other um, high-tech sort of... Um, publications in the in the USA and he's also he also runs a child safety organization called connectsafely.org and he's all in all a very good guy but i haven't seen his video yet how do you mean media 
The social web, otherwise known as Web 2.0 or the participatory web, is driven by young people around the world. It's also user produced. So people who are using the web are controlling what Web 2.0 looks like. And they're not just doing it on computers. They're using all sorts of devices, including, of course, mobile phones. Social networking is whatever anybody wants it to be. It can be a game, it can be a diary, it can be a place to learn digital media skills. And of course, it's a place where young people hang out. One thing is for sure, social networking is not going away. And it's not limited to a few sites. Of course, there are the big ones like MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, Bebo, Second Life. But there are thousands and thousands of social networking sites from all over the world. Even corporations are creating social networking sites. And of course, there are plenty of niche sites representing just about any human interest. One way to think about Web 1.0 is a famous New Yorker cartoon from July 1993. On the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. But on Web 2.0, everyone knows you're a dog. Assuming, of course, you tell them. On Web 2.0, teens aren't just consumers of information, they're producers. Nearly two-thirds of online teenagers have engaged in at least one type of content creation, and that's up 57% during a three-year period. And we also know that girls and boys are, in contrary to popular belief, most kids use it, and contrary to what a lot of people think, most kids use social networking sites to communicate with real-life friends people they know from school, church, and other venues. And while some teens do use social networking sites for romantic purposes, most say that they don't. Here's another myth busted. A lot of people think that teens are clueless when it comes to safety and privacy. But that's not true. Two thirds of teens who've created a profile say that their profile is not visible by all internet users. So teens do have a clue. And they're even relatively careful when it comes to photographs. Nearly 40% say that they restrict access to their photos most of the time. We can't talk about all of the social networking sites, but here are some of the major ones. MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, My Yearbook, Bebo, and High Five. These are all legitimate companies, mostly based in the United States, but they serve an international audience. But there are other sites. Twitter and Plurk are microblogging sites where people can type little short comments to share with their friends or what Twitter calls followers. And unless you specifically block someone, anybody can follow you on Twitter. Juicy Campus is a gossip site. There's total anonymity and there are no rules. And frankly, it's a bit rude, crude, and sometimes hurtful. Stick'em is a social video streaming site with live webcam chat. That can be scary. Ning allows users to create their own social networks. And of course, there's also Second Life and other virtual worlds where users interact through on-screen cartoon characters called avatars. So what are kids doing in social networking sites? For the most part, it's pretty good stuff, like producing, learning rules, decorating their profiles, or exploring their identities. They're writing blogs, they're writing software code, and they're creating media, including video. They're also assessing risk, and that's not necessarily a bad thing if they're learning how to safely push the envelope. Of course, they're discovering music, they're discussing interests, and if you look at the recent election in the United States, we've seen a lot of social and political activism online. And they're also keeping in touch with their friends over a long period of time. I know that because I have two kids in their 20s, and they're still using social networking sites and instant messaging to keep in touch with friends that they knew when they were young teenagers. But not everything that kids do in social networking sites is necessarily all that great. They may be seeking validation, which could be okay unless they're validating inappropriate or destructive behavior. They could be competing in a popularity contest. They could be venting. They could be showing off, embarrassing themselves, pulling pranks, getting even, or even harassing or bullying other people. But here's something to think about. The Suicide Prevention Lifeline says that both MySpace and Facebook 
are now its largest providers of referrals of kids who are in trouble and are thinking about taking their own lives. I think it's quite fair to say that there are teens alive today thanks to social networking sites. And even trumpeting the intention to commit a crime can be a positive thing if it averts the crime. There was a case in Ohio a couple of years ago where some teenagers indicated an intention to shoot up their school. A good citizen happened to come across that page, reported it to the police, and the tragedy was averted. So here's a question for you. What proportion of teenagers have been approached online by a sexual predator? Was it 1 in 20, 1 in 10, 1 in 7, 1 in 5, or almost half? It's a trick question, and it's based mostly on news reports that said that one out of five or later, one out of seven children had been approached by an online predator. The actual data came from a report from the Crimes Against Children Research Center at the University of New Hampshire. Based on a 2005 study, they found that one in seven youth had received an unwanted sexual solicitation online. But the solicitations did not necessarily come from predators about half were other young people. And they weren't necessarily devious or intended to lure. Most were limited to brief online comments or questions. And many were simply rude or vulgar, but not threatening. And most recipients didn't view the solicitations as serious or threatening. And almost all young people handled the unwanted sexual solicitations easily and effectively. So what we have here may be inappropriate behavior, but it is not sexual predation. So here's another question. Do you agree that the growth in young people's use of the internet correlates with a rise in sexual abuse against children? The answer may surprise you. As it turns out, between 1990 and 2004, the very period that saw an explosive growth in the use of the internet among young people, sexual predation against kids actually went down by 51%. I'm not suggesting that the internet was the reason it went down, but it certainly didn't cause it to go up. So as long as we're looking at misconceptions, let's examine the notion that posting personal information is dangerous. But it turns out that it doesn't correlate to risk, as much as meeting people online in lots of different ways, talking about sex with people known only online, and harassing others. As per that last issue, if you're mean to other people, they're likely to be mean to you. And if you need numbers to back that up, consider that aggressive behavior increases the odds of being victimized 2.3 times. Embarrassing others increased the risk almost five times, and meeting people in multiple ways increased it 3.4 times. As per talking about sex online with strangers, that doubles the risk. And you know that notion of the 40-year-old man claiming to be a 12-year-old girl? Well, it turns out that predators don't operate that way. Based on interviews with convicted sex offenders, only 5% of them pretended to be teens. And in some cases, the kids themselves are taking extraordinary risks by being aggressive, sexually suggestive, and posing in ways that make them look older. Statistically, the biggest risk to teens is cyberbullying or online harassment. Depending upon what study you look at, about a third of US teens have been harassed or bullied. Other studies show that it's more common, but some show that it's less. Either way, it's certainly a problem that affects millions of teenagers in the United States and even more around the world. You can't always tell if someone is a victim of cyberbullying, but there are some clues. Look for a loss of friends, depression, anxiety, and loss of sleep. Or if the child doesn't want to go to school or cover the screen or turns off devices when others come into the room. But of course, any of this can be symptoms of other problems, so don't necessarily assume that it's all about cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is almost always peer-to-peer. -peer. It's extremely rare when an adult is involved. And it's hard to escape because it can follow you home and even on the way between home and school. What's more, it can escalate into a serious situation. If you know a kid who's being bullied, tell them not to react. It might be exactly what the bully wants. They should also avoid retaliating. They should block the bully, save the evidence, and talk with a trusted adult. You might also have the young person talk to their friends at school to see if there's any peer-to-peer -peer pressure that can be leveraged against the bully. Today's mobile phones are really pocket personal computers. You can use them for social networking and even social mapping, 
where your friends know exactly where you are thanks to global positioning. You can share media by phone, and you can access the web and many applications. And bullies often use mobile phones to harass their victims 24-7. What we know about internet safety is that one size does not fit all. It turns out that a small number of teens get into trouble online, and it's roughly the same percentage of teens that get into trouble offline, probably the same teens. What we have to avoid is a single educational approach that treats all children as if they have the same risk factors. That's simply not the case. There are average kids that need a certain amount of education, and then there are high-risk kids that need some serious intervention. We also need to remember that the teenage brain is a work in progress. It takes about 25 years for the human brain to fully develop. And during adolescent years, the portion of the brain that helps regulate risk is not fully developed. So it's not about technology, it's about life. The internet increasingly mirrors all of human life. And while tech can aggravate and amplify problems, it doesn't usually cause them. When you break it all down, it's really not so much about young people as victims, but the way young people treat themselves and other people. It's really about digital citizenship. And what we need is a world where people treat each other civilly and respectfully, online and off. In summary, the social web is good for teens, but it can be bad for teens. It's a fact of life that's not going away, and it's not something that we can take control of because it's driven by users. So social web safety requires not only understanding benefits and risks, but it requires multiple forms of expertise and collaborative long-term response. I'd like to invite you to visit our forum at connectsafely.org. And by the way, one more thing. I look at the challenges of youth on the internet not so much as a problem, but as an opportunity. By helping young people make good decisions as to how they use the internet, we're preparing them for other decisions they're going to have to make during their youth and later in life. So it's not about avoiding all risk, but managing risks, and having young people understand that making good decisions and using critical thinking skills is their best defense. Oh. Well, we don't have Larry to thank here, but I'm sure he must be watching from U.S. at the moment, if he is. And Hi, Larry. Yes, uh, thank, thank you very much for your <laughs> presentation. And uh, it did give us a lot of food for thought, and which um, leads nicely into the next presentation. We heard about um, the issues related to how you know, strongly social networks are um, influential in our lives among young people. And we heard about some of the, mm, the concepts. And next, we are going to have John uh, represent MySpace, one of the biggest social networks, uh, networking sites, uh, and talk about what are the interventions there. Is it? Well, Zoe, I, I think I need to. The Zoe, you, Zoe, you think it's you? Yeah. I think it was, but that's fine. That's because I'm, I'm okay, happy yeah, too. Okay. And you want me to go next? Yes, please. Because uh, it's uh, this map. presentation is on okay. um, the interventions by MySpace. Okay, which? Uh, this one. I think it's this one. It's okay. It's all right. Yeah. The the other speaker that I arranged to come uh, to Hyderabad was uh, David Farris um, from Fox Interactive Media, who own. MySpace, and he couldn't make it because of the, well, for the same reason that Larry couldn't make it. And so David asked me if I would give his slides, his, his, power, his, his PowerPoint presentation. And since I act as an advisor to MySpace on, uh, on child safety issues, I obviously was very happy to agree to do that rather than miss out altogether. Um, well, uh, I mentioned it's uh, MySpace is owned by Fox Interactive Media which is a major sort of media player, you know, Fox Movies and Fox News, Fox Sport, American Idol, and all of those things. And part of their, uh, the company's strategy is to leverage and use these, these different media assets as part of um, helping their overall strategy. So you find these things popping up and as part of the overall Fox and MySpace offering. Um, it describes itself as a social media portal. Um, I'm not 
probably not going to be very good at the sort of ad advertising and marketing aspect that's clearly uh, involved in, in this presentation, but you can see this is how MySpace positions itself. Um, and, and you can see it's a, it's a, global, uh, a global operation. I think it's still um, the, technically the largest in terms of number of users and the number of countries that it operates in. It's not the number one in every country that it, that it works in, but uh, globally, when you add it all together, it, it is the largest, um, well, certainly one of the largest social networking uh, sites and operations. There are the statistics, which you can see. And, uh, there's no need for me particularly to read them all out. They're all very clear. 89, this is all based on uh, independent research. 89% of their members are are uh, 18 or above and there you can see the scale uh, the scale on which uh, MySpace operates 31 different countries 17 different languages and I have to say and obviously beg pardon visits clicks on on the site that, that's all yeah um, and uh, partly because of the history of the way social networking developed, partly because of some, you know, the, the attention that this issue got, uh, particularly in the United States, it's all, the, whole, the whole online safety thing has been a really big uh, question for MySpace from, uh, from the very, very beginning. And they use a, a variety of tools, technology, education, working in partnership with NGOs and the police, um, and working internationally as, as well. I mean, that's why David was uh, very pleased, David Farris was very pleased to have been invited to come here. And safety is, uh, and it's a very strong message that the company has about building safety into, into all of its different features. Um, bits of MySpace are uh, cordoned off to uh, adults. So there are some bits of the site which you cannot access uh, if you've registered uh, as being less than 18, um, dating, anything, anything of that kind of an adult nature. And sometimes when, um, uh, when certain types of videos, they do webisodes and they have TV programs on there which are categorized as having adult content, they will operate uh, according to the watershed. Now, that's quite an important point, by the way, because one of the things you often hear said about, about the, the internet is that it's made the watershed redundant. Well, in fact, it hasn't, uh, and MySpace is, the, is living proof of it. They, they operate, in, you know, how the internet works, you can detect what country somebody's coming from, from the IP address that you, that you recognize when they log in. So, for example, in, in the UK, we have a generally accepted watershed policy that nothing that is unsuitable for children should be shown before 9 o'clock. And so there was, a, there was a series that was broadcast uh, which was about vampires, which is a very popular theme, uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer and all of that. Well, there was a similar program uh, created and broadcast first through MySpace that you couldn't watch whatever age you were. I think, in fact, MySpace made it 10 o'clock in the evening if you were in the UK. And they were able to do the same thing in other countries where they were operating. So this idea that the internet has made watershed policies redundant uh, isn't true, uh, because, and my, the, what MySpace does uh, is, is evidence of that. Um, every single uh, image, be it a video uh, or a photograph, a still photograph, is reviewed by MySpace uh, staff. Now they don't they're not able to view them before they're posted. But within uh, a number of hours, and it varies, um, it can vary according to the volumes, uh, within a number of hours, uh, every single picture, uh, um, photograph will have been viewed, and every single video would have been viewed. Now with videos, it's not possible to view the whole of the video. That, that would be too time consuming. Um, but what they do is they have a very clever piece of software, I've seen it working myself, which takes random screenshots from different parts of the video, and those random screenshots are viewed. And if there's anything in the random screenshots that the trained operatives think 
suggest that there may be some bad content elsewhere on the video, then the whole video is pulled out and the whole video is looked at and the decision is then taken about whether or not to remove it. And so there's quite a lot of um, activity, uh, active, active, uh, active engagement by MySpace in p policing and patrolling the content of the site. That's not just videos and pictures, by the way, it's also text. And there's the, there's the list of things that, 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 that they do. One particular feature, which I know has um, been discussed elsewhere in other workshops, and this they only do in the United States, and it's only possible in the United States because of the way the system works over there. They have, in, the, in America, a register of convicted sex offenders, um, and th this is a public document. And uh, a company called S Sentinel has gathered in these registers of sex, of sex offenders from each of the 50 states, and made that uh, 50 different databases into one database. And uh, anybody who is on that database is basically barred from being a member of MySpace. Uh, the, uh, the British government um, has, in a, in, a, in, a, in a new law that came in, that was passed by Parliament about six months ago, has taken powers to do the same thing. In other words, in future, uh, in the United Kingdom, you were, all registered sex offenders will be required to provide their email addresses and any other electronic logins that they might use. And the government have said that they intend to make it a requirement for, for, for convicted sex offenders then only to use those email addresses or electronic logins that they've registered with the government and failure to do that, in other words, if you use a fake email address or one that you haven't registered, in itself will be an offence uh, for which you could go to jail for up to five years. And so that also opens up the possibility of, um, and the government have said they're in, I mean, the government are investigating doing the same thing as, as MySpace and, and a number of other American sites are already doing to make it possible for online providers to block access by convicted sex offenders in, in, in the United Kingdom. There's a slight complication with all of this in the United Kingdom in that in the UK, unlike in America, the Sex Offences Register is not a public document, it's a private document. So there's going to have to be uh, encryption and various other clever things done to make sure that the Sex Offences Register remains private. They won't hand it over to um, a, a private company. That's it. That was nice and short, I hope. Yes, that was perfect and on time. Good. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. Uh, although I'm not a Microsoft, uh, sorry, MySpace representative, I would just like to add one more uh, thing that was, you know, not in the slide, and I'm very much aware that it's the current uh, way of working. They have developed an algorithm that um, can go through the different profile and find out which profile is, you know, b belongs to young people. So yeah. that algorithm is a proprietary algorithm developed by MySpace. And the comment that I want to put here is how do we allow that kind of uh, techniques or technology to be shared or used by, um, I mean, there is a question of, you know, copyrights and intellectual property rights. Uh, but how do we as a group um, to tackle the issue, how do we make these technologies available to other providers. Yeah. So I, sh I should have said in the presentation, yeah, that's a very important thing that MySpace does. Essentially, um, children tell lies about their age when they register for social networking sites. This is known. Uh, and what the algorithm does is it, it, it scrutinizes texts and postings to, to try and check up uh, on what children are saying about, their, about themselves. And there are various clever ways in which it can find people who've not told the truth about their age. And um, several thousand people per month are thrown off MySpace for, for not telling the truth uh, about their age. Uh, there is no age verification system in existence in the United States or indeed in hardly any other country in the world is there one that's, that could be used to verify people, young people's ages, people under the age of 18. But this algorithm is the closest they can get to trying to confirm that people have told the truth about their age. Thanks, John. So we move on to... Uh, you want to go first? Well, 
Okay, so the next panelist is um, Margareta Trang from uh, the European Commission, and she represents the Cefer Internet Program, and she will be talking about that. I will make uh, an overview of the European approach how to, um, uh, to empowering and protecting children in the online environment implement, plan, implemented by the European Commission. We have been active in both the regulatory and non-regulatory fields, in particular through a succession of safer internet programs since 1999. Within the program, we have worked towards an inclusive approach bringing together all concerned stakeholders, from industry to researchers, teachers, parents, and NGOs active in child welfare, and encourage them to cooperate, exchange ideas, best practice, and experiences in order to empower and protect young people when using online and mobile technologies. In order to use the internet in a safer and more responsible way, Parents and children need to be informed and educated. Through the program, the European Union has fostered the creation of a Europe-wide network, INSAFE, which coordinates awareness raising activities in 26 European countries. The acti activities of the network aim to empower children and to raise awareness among parents and teachers and include the organization of workshops in schools and cooperation with mobile phone companies and social networking sites to develop educational materials on safety issues. InSafe also organizes Safer Internet Day in February every year, an event which has increased the public awareness on child online safety issues considerably in addition to giving strong and positive visibility to European initiatives. Last year, more than 120 organizations in 56 countries took part in this initiative, organizing local, national and pan-European events, ranging from safety sessions in schools and competitions for young people to public meetings and conferences. In addition, the program supports a network of hotlines coordinated by InHop Association. Hotlines are important contact points for receiving reports of illegal content, which they analyze and pass on to the appropriate body for action, such as a law enforcement agency or an ISP. Today, the network has 33 members across the world, not only in the EU member states, but also in the US, Canada, Australia, Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. The network of hotlines is a concrete example of the international cooperation, which is particularly important in the fight against child abusive content, since this material could be produced in one country, stored in a second, and accessed in a third. According to the InHope Global Internet Trend Report, published in 2007, Hotlines have processed 9,600 confirmed reports of child abusive images per month. As part of its actions, the Safer Internet Program also supports a number of networks focused on specific themes, namely the EU Kids Online network of researchers who identify and compare research carried out in Europe on the use of new media by children. In Axel, who represents civil society in relation to child protection on the internet and new media, CIRCAMP for facilitating cooperation of law enforcement agencies with a specific objective to limit the market of commercial distribution of child abuse material online. The Youth Protection Roundtable for facilitating and coordinating exchange of views on technical and pedagogical measures against unwanted and harmful online content. The program also supports industry self-regulation regimes where they are broadly accept accepted by stakeholders and where they provide for effective enforcement. Let's take the example of mobile phones, which have been adopted very rapid rapidly by European youngsters and children where we have had a proactive approach in assessing potential risks and solutions. 
The results of a Eurobarometer survey conducted a few months ago in the EU member states show that at least 6 out of 10 children aged 6 to 17 have their own mobile phone. The figure is even higher among older children and 94% of the 15 to 17 years old have their own mobile. At the same time, children and young people are among the biggest users group of online technologies in Europe. They are further the experts of web uh, 2.0 services such as social networking sites, blogs and instant messaging. One of the recent changes is, is that now a significant number of children have internet access through the mobile. In some European countries already 20 to 30 percent of children access internet through the mobile. This means that many children face a number of risks and priority should be to find the best and most effective ways of protecting them and to fight to reduce these risks without overprotecting the children. Because as the children grow older, one should move from protecting children to empowering them to recognize these risks and to be able to handle them. In an area such as online and mobile technologies where things are changing extremely fast, the best solution for regulation is for the industry to come up with a system that allows them to deal with any kind of issues that might come up. A successful example of this is the Commission initiative leading to the signature of the European Framework for Safer Mobile Use by younger teenagers and children, by leading mobile operators and content providers in 2007. This framework describes principles and measures to protect children that those companies assign the agreement commit to implement on the national level throughout Europe. In 2008, the agreement had been signed by, the, by a total of 24 mobile operators serving 96% of the EU mobile phone customers. As an offspring of the European initiative, the mobile operators uh, GSM Association have further launched a global alliance against child abuse images. Following this successful initiative, the Commission is now discussing with social networking sites a set of guidelines meant to ensure children's and young people's online safety. We believe that there is a need to strengthen the protection of children when using social networking sites because young people have been particularly quick in adopting these sites, which for some has even become their main online activity. The Eurobarometer survey I mentioned earlier also shows that this is a major concern for parents since when asked the questions, are there online activities that your child is not allowed to do? By far the largest proportion of parents, 43%, said that their children were not allowed to create a profile in an online community. Research shows that most children and young people use social networking sites with the intention of maintaining and enhancing already existing social relations. But some also use these sites for making new friends. Children are very creative and participative, and this gives them a new freedom with, which comes with risks. Okay, Margareta, if you can speed up a little bit. We have two more minutes. Yeah, yeah, I'm almost done. There is therefore a need for a collective approach to make sure that young people can have the best of this freedom while remaining safe. This is also a need for the internet industry to take a proactive role in protecting minors using these services. For this purpose, the European Commission has convened a social networking task force with 17 operators of social networking sites used by under-18s, both Europe-wide, such as MySpace, Facebook, YouTube, and sites with national coverage, Weibo, Hives, Skyrock, etc., and a number of researchers and child welfare organizations. The objective is to agree on voluntary guidelines for use of social networking sites by children. We seem to be moving towards an agreement and we hope that this process will have a concrete result by the next Safer Internet Day, which will take place on the 10th of February next year.
And lastly, I would like to mention that the European Commission will continue its efforts to increase the safety of, of children online beyond the current program, and the new Safer Internet program will enter into fo force on the 1st of January next year. Just a few more. Many of the successful activities will be maintained in the new program and it will focus strongly on reducing online circulation of child abuse material and raising awareness about how to stay safe online. Encompassing re recent communication services such as social networking, the scope of the program has been broadened to include harmful conduct like grooming and cyberbullying and to include also commun other communication technologies than internet, like mobile phones and game consoles. So I would like to thank you for, uh, for your attention, and if you would like to have some more information about the program, I invite you to visit our website, which you can find on ec.europa.eu slash safer internet. Thank you. Thank you, Margareta. Um, it, you know, um, this presentation shows us um, some of the you know, overlapping issues that uh, social networks being discussed uh, many times. Uh, the educational initiatives, I just wanted to reflect on one point that was raised in the first video that we saw, that in spite of, uh, you know, not that all uh, young people who get into these social networks are unaware of the risks. They are educated, they are guided. In spite of that, they fall into the trap. So maybe uh, we need to adapt, we need to include certain elements in the education system as well, um, based on cultures, um, because it's so diverse around the world. What kind of uh, educational model in terms of online safety uh, we should develop? I think that's uh, something that we need to think about. And uh, also the fact that this regional network um, in Europe is working um, so well and it addresses the different elements, educational and awareness uh, involving the mobile phones and so on. Uh, we will have a, a bit, uh, you know, a short description of uh, another region which doesn't have that kind of setup. So we'll probably delve into those discussions as uh, that presentation takes place. But now I will hand it over to Zoe Hilton of um, both NSPCC and ENAXO and she will be um, presenting the, the initiative of INAXO here. Thank you, Zoe. Hello. Um, I'm here from the NSPCC, but I'm also here to represent a new European uh, network known as INAXO, the European NGO Alliance for Child Safety Online. Firstly, just a bit about my organization, very briefly, the NSPCC stands for the National Society of Cruelty to Children, and we're a large youth working to protect children from a range of abuse, including sexual exploitation. And we do a lot of work around internet safety, including collaborating with law enforcement against children's sexual exploitation online. I know that a lot of people in the room have already heard quite a lot about Enaxo, so I hope that isn't, this isn't overkill. But Enaxo, for those who haven't heard yet, is a new network of 13 uh, children's rights organizations from different EU countries. Um, working in coalition across Europe to advocate for the rights of children and to protect them from some of the risks of uh, new technologies. And we hope to begin to work more closely um, in, and to speak with one unified voice. Um, there are a number of networks uh, already in existence, but what this one uh, hopes to do and focus on is to provide an advocacy uh, role in the European international environment in the same way that NSPCC has done domestically with a network of UK charities. Um, and apologies before I move on that I couldn't get all the logos onto the slide. It was beyond me. Um, but that, that gives you a flavor of, of, of the voice that we may have. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, children's uh, exploitation in child abuse images and some of the work that we've done in the UK. And then I'm going to briefly touch on some of the issues, the wider issue of sexual abuse through online grooming. I want to um, just frame these challenges in terms of how NGOs and civil society groups working for children can take a role in advocacy and representing children, working with children, speaking for children, or uh, preferably empowering them to speak uh, when working with a range of different um, stakeholders. 
I'm going to talk mainly about UK experience because it's what I know, um, but we've become, we're aware through the Enaxo network that there are some excellent um, examples of campaigns in different countries and civil society taking a key role. So in terms of, um, in terms of uh, the problem, I want to say a bit about um, the problem of child abuse images, uh, first of all. Um, so in relation to how we've campaigned for uh, change in the UK, and I think we've now reached a critical stage where the work that we do internationally is actually critical to keeping pace uh, with new challenges. So just as a bit of background, we know that in the last 10 years we've seen what's often referred to as the, uh, the multi-billion dollar global market for images uh, and video of children being sexually assaulted, raped and tortured. It is materials, sexual abuse materials, not just images. Um, and there's been a bit of confusion, I think, in this conference about harmful content. And actually, when we talk about child abuse material, we are talking about just that. Um, as we know, there's been a huge rise, and the, the trade is claiming very young victims. This table is from the UK's Internet Watch Foundation, uh, latest report in terms of the images that they come across. And I thought it was quite shocking in terms of the ages. They find that 80% involve children under 10, um, and as many as 10% of the images involve children under 2. They also note um, a trend towards crueler and ever more sadistic uh, images. And this, these statistics seem to fit with other sources, um, including the National Centre for Missing and Exploited Children and university studies. So, um, sorry, I'm, my slides seem to be slightly mixed. Um, in the UK, so the Internet Watch Foundation has been highly successful in removing child abuse images hosted in Usenet groups or websites hosted in the UK. When it began its work, 19% of all child abuse images found in the UK were being published in the UK. Um, and uh, overwhelmingly, due to the Internet Watch Foundation, and pressure from civil society groups, including the NSPCC and the network of children's charities um, of CHIS, um, the material found in the UK and published in the UK is taken down. And the challenge for us now, and has been for us um, more recently, is to ensure that UK servers block access to sites that carry images even when they're hosted overseas. So uh, to have a uniform system of blocking. And we've been campaigning for UK-based internet service providers to block access to all these images when they're hosted in other countries. In 2004, British Telecom offered all ISPs the technical information which underpins their blocking system. Getting ISPs, um, but getting ISPs to use it in the UK has taken many years of public lobbying and consensus building. It wasn't just something uh, that ISPs simply agreed to do. They've taken, it's taken years, I think, of, of nudging. Um, so for exa an example of our campaigning work, in 2006 we launched the Help Stop Child Pornography on the Internet campaign for which new campaigners sent uh, postcards to the Home Office to ask the government to require ISPs to state publicly what they were doing to fight child abuse images. So it was a, a, a way of trying to publicly shame um, the ISPs if they weren't using the blocking list. And to date we now know that now, um, due to government pressure and our public pressure, 95% of our ISPs connecting are using the blocking list in the UK, but we need to continue and we will continue until we have 100%. But the campaign helped us to mobilize a public outrage on an issue to achieve change. And this, um, this slide shows the petition that we sent around to our database of 150,000 supporters, and a high proportion of them wrote to the Home Office, so they had lots of letters and, and postcards on their desk um, demanding change. They also, we also gave them options to personalize letters, so we managed to sort of mobilize public. This is the other side of the card. Um, so we used, you know, we, we really used our, our supporters. I'd also say that from a UK uh, perspective, we use the me we're able to use the media because this issue um, gains a huge amount of attention uh, from the media, and, and that's something we've benefited from and contributed to in terms of achieving change. Um, These are recent uh, new newspaper headlines, but it constantly, day, day to day, we get um, new more news stories about this issue, and so we manage to keep it present in the public mind. So we still have a huge amount of work to do um, in the UK, 
um, it, not just in terms of um, uh, the, the blocking, but also in, and in closing that last five percent, but also in terms of identifying victims, ensuring adequate police respo responses, and adequate uh, professional response to children who are abused in images. But I think, in practical terms, if we're thinking seriously about getting to the root of the problem, there are a range of ways where we think that we need to tackle an, uh, international, the issue internationally and work better um, internationally and keep raising the debate. So I just want to touch on a few of the um, barriers and issues. A key uh, issue for the INAXO is why is about how children abused in images are identified and their protection followed up. The Interpol database of child abuse images contains photographic evidence of about half a million children, and they estimate that fewer than a thousand individual children have ever been identified and located in real life. As, as our partners Save the Children need the advocacy on this work, and they've pointed out that there's a failure to ensure clear mandates and ownership of investigations at national and international level, where the geography of a crime is uncertain and you don't know where the image is from. They note uh, that the forces often lack the appropriate mandate, support, and technical resources to carry out victim ID. It's also less high profile than disrupting networks of traders that are going at the moment. But it is child-centered, and from a children's rights point of view, it's something that we do need to hold on to as a network. I think there's a lack of um, a global industry commitment around blocking. Um, and there's been commitment from the GNSA, as we heard, um, to blocking access to child abuse images from the mobile phone networks and all the major mo mobiles, but as n yet no similar kind of commitment from the ISPs and no global ISP uh, agreement to do that kind of uh, blocking. So we really need to see some more convincing leadership um, internationally. Another issue uh, that we need to tackle is the barriers to getting child abuse material that's hosted in other countries taken down swiftly. Obviously there's great work done by the InHope Network and we support that. Um, but as others in the room know, probably in more detail, we're clearly struggling with the speed it takes to remove child abuse images and the time it takes. Uh, recent uh, research completed a comparative analysis of the takedown times of different forms of content. Um, and it found that phishing sites or sites which threaten banks' commercial interests can be taken down literally in a matter of hours. Um, child abuse image sites, by contrast, are likely to stay up uh, many weeks, uh, if not months. And obviously that there are understandable complexities, but due to the fact that different jurisdictions don't work together and reports go through local law enforcement, which may not uh, prioritize the issue, um, the material s stays there. And that is something that we need to look at. I think we also need to ensure that we're better able to address the technical challenges and problems of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing around child abuse images. Uh, we know that there is a technology to prevent peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing, but it's difficult where encryption is used. It's not been, um, there's not a commercial imperative to develop it widely in relation to child abuse images. And I'll, I would also say, acknowledge that as the problem moves, the, this whole problem of child abuse images moves from the public internet towards um, private peer-to-peer -peer and file sharing, there are substantial political and legal and ethical issues that we do need to tackle head on and resolve as well as, as, well as the technical ones. Um, the issues are also enormously uh, resource-based, I think, and we know that resources in terms of policing capacity to investigate crime and bring offenders to justice um, are limited. Uh, John was saying in his presentation earlier in the week, only five police forces so far have joined the Virtual Global Task Force, which is the force geared towards tackling this issue. And we know that the lack of police resources is a major issue. Um, there's also a lack of uh, recognition around child abuse images in different national legislations and different police procedures. In the UK, we've campaigned on the resource issue and we have the specialist uh, policing resource which uh, tackles um, child abuse images. Uh, but we, uh, and as well as grooming as their primary focus, but we know that there is, um, a, a, this is a worldwide issue. Um, slightly tangential, but I was quite interested to read up on some of the recent political uh, activity on this in the US. 
uh, in a recent bill to Congress, which I understand didn't pass, they tried to get uh, 320 million over the next five years for more resources because of a kind of crisis lack of resources to do these kind of investigations. You've got the FBI saying that they must triage their, uh, their num the overwhelming number of child exploitation crimes and can't investigate a large percentage of crimes. I'm coming to the end of what I wanted to speak about, but I also just want to acknowledge um, that sexual exploitation isn't just about child abuse images, of course. It is about um, online sexual abuse and the use of the internet to target and abuse children, both in terms of adults arranging to meet children in the real world to abuse them, but also to, uh, to exploit them online through virtual activities. Um, police reports in the UK suggest that this is more important than ever, warning of an increase in the use of non-contact abuse and particularly aggressive uh, grooming techniques. Uh, this this uh, contradicts slightly what the first video uh, suggested when they looked at a sort of prevalence level uh, study of, of population. I think if you look at what the police find, then you get quite different findings. We've done a lot of work around this in the UK. Obviously, there is a substantial role for education. Where I would agree with the video this, uh, earlier um, is that I think you do need to target education, whereas, e whereas education is essential. Um, when you're working with children who've been sexually exploited already, who are very highly vulnerable, um, whose families are in crisis, uh, who have various different levels of problems, they're not going to be reached through mainstream education programs. They need targeted programs. Um, one of the things that we've lobbied for in the UK is the grooming legislation. Um, the, the, the UK law now recognizes grooming and sexual, online sexual forms of sexual exploitation. Um, there's absolutely no point having a law unless you use it and you have the resources and the police resources to use it. And again, this is something that we've really pushed for in the UK with the NSPCC in coalition with other charities with CHIS um, to make sure uh, that we have a specialist response uh, from the CEOP Centre. There's also, of course, a huge role for technical safeguards, and we heard about a bit about that from the uh, MySpace, but um, this is a significant role in terms of integrating technical safeguards into